Uh, hi, I'm Pete. I'm one of the uh, registrars in Nottingham. Well, actually, I'm going to be in Leicester next year. Um, so Rick asked me just to do, do a couple of talks. Um, I thought what I really wanted to do today was um, go through uh, disorders of consciousness, just go through some basics, but also um, it is a very slippery slope and I can easily get bogged down in the detail, um, but I thought it'd be quite a nice idea at least so you know what we're looking for um when often we get asked to come and see patients for prognostication purposes and things like that i don't want to go into prognostication because i think that's a whole talk in its own right um <clears throat> but um i think i just want to give you a general idea and hopefully there'll be some things you can take away from this um, for your everyday practice, particularly when it comes to assessing consciousness and a localization um, within uh, the realms of intensive care medicine. Um, so when it comes to disorder consciousness, I thought I'd very quickly go through the GCS in Glasgow, uh, Glasgow Coma Scale, um, just because there, I, whilst yes, it is a very simple thing I, I really hope all of you can do, there are a couple of nuances and there are a few areas where I think people do have issues. Um, so personally, when I get wrong with somebody and they they read out a GCS on its own, without the breakdown, it's pretty meaningless. I mean, a patient who's asleep will have a low GCS. And, you know, that's because their eyes are closed and they're not wanting to talk. Um, I find that the eye opening and verbal are probably less or are, are definitely less important than the motor. And usually that's what I want to know when so he wakes me up at three o'clock in the morning. Um, but within that, I think there's just a couple of caveats to that. Um, eye opening in particular, um, we'll come to this later on, but certainly patients in um, unresponsive wakefulness states, they'll open their eyes, but it's fairly meaningless. Um, so it's, uh, we'll come back to that particular nuance later on. But um, the motor responses, um, I, I don't know whether any of you have experiences this but certainly between the differences between abnormal flexion and normal flexion uh, whether anybody uh, could wishes to shed any light as to what their own views are on that i have to hear your thoughts otherwise i'm more than happy to tell you how i tell the difference stunned silence. All right, so um, I think this is it's a very simple thing, but when you look at flexion away from pain, what I'm looking for in a normal flexion is quite a fast response. They're saying, this is painful, I'm withdrawing, I'm getting my hand out of the way. Whereas an abnormal flexion, what you'll find is it's a slow movement, usually into, say, a decorticate um, posture. It's that slow flexion of the hand uh, when you provide pressure on the nail bled um, and even when you go for superorbital that slow flexion away so as to oppose to the very quick movements um, uh, how do you do the painful stimuli um, technically when you when they tell you to do it it's supposed to be 10 seconds of pressure the fingertip pressure um, I tend not to personally use the trapezius pinch that much, although I'm sure a lot of you do. I don't think there's any issue with that. I find the superorbital is my favorite because particularly when it comes to localization, you can see how high the hand comes up above the level of the clavicle will be localizing, obviously. Um, it's quite useful. If I'm doing prognostication, particularly in ITU, um, I find that I tend to do all four limbs um, for uh, fingertip pressure, and then I go for a superorbital bilaterally as well. You can get some variation, and I find uh, particularly patients who've been in ITU for a while and they've got a bit of uh, intensive care uh, neuropathy, critical care neuropathy, that it's quite good to see if there are any differences. Um, all right, then. Um, and the other thing I'd say in the ITU setting, um, Often your patients are quite somnolent. They've got a lot of drugs on board. Simply going up to them once, prodding them in the eyeball, on, you know, in the superorbital pressure and walking away isn't really good enough. I usually start by, where possible, they haven't got trauma or anything, um, shaking them, shouting really loudly, at least try and get a response. And often it requires repetitive stimulation. You take the best result from that. Um, and I think you'll notice, particularly in the, the nursing clocking, that you get this variance, and it's often to do with 
the fact that they're not really gone and trying to wake the patient up. I'm sure you've seen that when you've examined the patients, you've got higher readings and things. It's often because you really need to wake them up and give a lot of stimulation. Um, yeah, you know, I don't want to spend too long on GCS because it's it's fairly dull. Um, going on to just a few the terminology um, for disorders of consciousness. Um, in the acute setting, when somebody comes into hospital and they're unresponsive, less than four weeks, the consensus um, is to call that coma. Uh, after that four week period of time, uh, as patients also start waking up and showing a few extra signs, we change the nomenclature and we have a few other conditions that we bring into that. There'll be the persistent vegetative state or the unresponsive wakefulness state or minimally conscious state. Okay. Um, just generally, this is quite a nice summary of things um, that just generally gives you a bit of a, a, um, a picture and I can't kind of like table. This is all taken from the uh, RCP uh, guideline, 2020 guideline. Um, on disorders of consciousness. Um, and of course, you can see the quite a large variance within coma. Coma, they can go anything from a GCS of three to to pretty high, sort of an eight. So, you know, there's quite a large variance. And of course, that means that the prognostication variation is, is quite big as well. Um, of course, with the more severe injury, the prognosis is going to be a little bit worse. I'm going to break these down a little bit more. And as I just like to do this in the form of trying to work through at least describe a patient that I had on the wards last year. So I had a gentleman last year um, came into the cardiology ward, a young chap, 41 years old, uh, no past medical history, it had an out of hospital cardiac arrest. Downtime was about 20 minutes. Um, it was all quite sad. His wife was pregnant and he had a five or six year old as well. Um, so he came into hospital um, in the acute setting, of course, um, taken by the cardiologist straight to cath lab. Um, he was intubated at that time and actually he was extubated relatively quickly within I think 48 hours or so. So he had some breathing responses and certainly for the first month um, his GCS was pretty low and his degree of, of any interaction was low. But very slowly he started going through pretty much all the states that we will have seen. So initially he comes in in coma and then sort of, it was actually probably a week or two in, um, he started showing some responses. When we say some responses, there's a difference between meaningful cortical responses and sort of more of a brainstem level of arousal. Um, often, I think you will have seen this with patients where they've had a low GCS, they start coming around. And one of the very first things you might see is the eye opening. Okay. And that's very typical in you know the state known as a persistent vegetative state which is a bit it can it's not the best name in the world certainly in the states and in europe they are referring this to as a unresponsive wakefulness um and these patients can open their eyes they can have sleep uh, wake cycles very interesting with and um, the chap i had last year i mean, it's something i see quite commonly when you describe eye opening, they have these roving eye movements. As to say, they open their eyes. Quite typically, what they'll do is they open the eyes, look left, look center, look right, and then close their eyes again for a period of time. There's not purposeful localization of looking at you. Um, what they tend to do is, even if they do look at you, it, it's more of a there's no there's no, there are no saccadic eye movements. So relatives often describe and certainly the chap I had last year his wife would say he opens his eyes he but he seems to see through me she's not really focusing properly on you and had these nice saccadic eye movements following a, a pattern following he's not following you around the around the around the room not tracking you um the other thing they can have they can have some grimacing to pain and quite often you'll see that uh, you see quite we go through suborbital pressure and of course, the relatives go, oh my gosh, you're really hurting him. The fact is the amount of cortical um, activity is probably quite low. So how much they're actually picking up is low, but you do have some response. Um, that's quite typical. Um, they should have their brainstem reflexes. Oh, and the other one, they, very key one there is the grasp reflex. And some of these primitive reflexes, I'm sure all of you will have had patients where the relative comes up to you and goes, oh, but he, he, he squeezed my hand. Well, you know, it's a, it's a primitive reflex. A baby will squeeze your hand. Um, 
so it, it demonstrates a level of arousal with these primitive reflexes, but it's not meaningful movement. Okay. Um, as a, patients come out of this um, unresponsive wakefulness state or the persistent vegetative state, um, you come into more of a minimally conscious state. Now, the minimally conscious state, um, there's, you're beginning to have some cortical function. My gentleman started grunting. You be, then began to make the odd sound, then consistently tracking you around the room. And um, certainly, uh, more recently, they changed the, the, the nomenclature to, 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 to try and show the range of, of different responses that you can get out of a patient. So you get these, these, these modes of the crying is quite common. I've seen have quite a few patients that are crying, not necessarily for any reason, um, reaching for objects. Um, and if you break this down into a little bit further, the new nomenclature changes this into the middle conscious states, minus and plus. So in a mind, minor state, they all have these more simple motor and base functions with pursuing around the room, the visual pursuit, turning to sounds. They're often reaching for things, and but often non-purposeful movement. But as they come out of that, you begin to get a bit more pur purposeful movement. Um, they can grasp things, hold things, but more with a more meaningful manner. Uh, very simple commands, but often... They, whilst it might be a simple command, it, it's often non-reproducible and inconsistent. Um, sometimes you get yes, no. Um, occasionally you get these gestures. Um, the RCP, uh, quite a nice little diagram this, that just shows you this level of consciousness and arousal. And as you come out of the min minimally conscious state, you come into an emerged state where you actually have quite good or reliable, consistent um, cortical function Often, of course, if you push them, they're still confused. I mean, they're not going to tell them, tell you where they are or what's going on. But um, you, you're beginning to at least get some some consistency in their responses. And of course, with all of these things, the the length of time that they're in the state um, and how and which state they're in does have big bearing um, on prognosis. Now, why do I mention this? So. It's good to go on through through um, through just the nomenclature, but this is one of the most important things. Well, certainly, the, in my opinion, um, I wanted to go through is really what's going on, what keeps us awake, why are we alert, and then you can try and extrapolate this to the patients that you see uh, on the intensive care unit, and we can try and localize where the problems are. So arousal comes from a lot of uh, structures, um, multiple of them. There are these pathways that begin in the brain stem that come up ascending, so the ascending systems involving midbrain, the thalamus, the uh, hypothalamus, and then you get these cortical circuits. So you have these, um, so these multiple pathways. Now that concludes the adrenergic pathway. That's the locus cerulaeus, which is your sympathetic pathway. You have the 5-HT, which comes from the RAPE. You've got acetylcholinergic pathways, the peduncular pontine reticular formations. And these rise up. There's a big relay switch in the thalamus, and that is intricately involved with uh, thalamocortical um, circuitry. Uh, that, that that feeds through into the cortex that keeps us awake. Okay. Now, this is important because this goes wrong. So in order for somebody to lose consciousness, you can either have a global insult, be that bihemispheric or give somebody a whole lot of drugs, your benzodiazepines, firing off all the gabergic ne neurons in the brain that are more of a global level. But then equally, you can have smaller problems at pretty much any of these levels and this is important because as you'll see later on or a little bit later on um, we can try and work out and localize through some of the other signs as to where the level of the problem is and that's very useful for prognostication and, uh, and seeing what's happening with the patient um, so and I like, I like the statement from 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 the nature of neurology um, it doesn't really matter what the etiology is. Um, this withdrawal of this excitatory 
synaptic activity going into the cortex is what is going wrong when you, you reduce someone's consciousness. Um, this is a great picture of just showing you the sheer number of pathways coming up. It's from the same journal um, where they've shown you some of these reticular fibers coming up in purples, the peduncular pontine reticular formation, with these large thalamic projections coming up bilaterally. Um, you won't better see it in green is the raphe in dark blue, although I really can't see that. Uh, would be the locus cellulaeus. Um, but these are the different pathways, the 5-HT pathways, the cholinergic pathways and the adrenergic pathways. They come into the to the thalamus and particularly the, um, the central nuclei. But um, if you look at studies in patients who are in coma, you get this disconnection. And once you get this disconnection, there's loss of this excitatory input into the cortex from the thalamus or even at the thalamic, here in this case, you have it at the thalamic level. That is when your level of arousal drops. Okay, I, I don't want to go through this too much. This is a uh, that's another nightmare about these uh, thalamocortical uh, circuits um, and how you get this loss of excitation. Um, I don't want to get too involved in that, but essentially, some it, some studies have shown that some patients in coma have been given some medications such as Zolpidem and actually woken up and it's really to do with these circuits and altering the firing of the thalamocortical circuits. Um, but this is what I want to spend a little bit longer on and just go through slowly. Okay, so <clears throat> this is important because we can do some bedside tests that you're going to be doing anyway on the intensive care unit and we can actually see quite a lot from this. And this is just trying to go through why we do these tests and why do we do the pupillary light test? This is an extremely useful test um, it, because it's multi-level. The, the pupillary test is, it, it can tell you a hell of a lot and give great localization. You have your, your afferent coming down the optic pathways that go uh, down the optic nerve and they go to the pretectal nucleus, as I'm sure you know, which goes to our favorite Edinger westphal nucleus, which is accessory third. Uh, nerve nuclei um, that brings about uh, via the third nerve uh, pupillary constriction. And you can get a hell of a lot of information from that. Um, that also the, the parasympathetic pathway fires through that. And, and sort of why is this so important? You can see, so this is just another picture just showing that we have the parasympathetic and sympathetic pathway. The sympathetic comes from the uh, hypothalamus, um, it comes dorsally uh, down uh, through the pons, down the brainstem, comes up through the sympathetic uh, chain and up to the ciliary ganglion. Um, and this is quite useful because you can look at some of the pupils and work out where the level of the problem is. So clearly, some, as you're I'm sure you know, somebody's herniating and they've got an uncle herniation, the third nerve gets squished. You lose your sympathetic um, uh, input, so you have a so you lose the parasympathetic input, so you have a, a big blown pupil. Um, likewise, if you have both of the uh, third nuclei getting taken out, uh, sort of by a tectal problem, you're going to have two big eyes. Um, if the pons gets taken out, um, the descending sympathetic tract gets lost, and then you're going to have these pontine, these these pinpoint pupils. And sort of, if, if both gets taken out, you have a unreactive uh, normal pupils. Okay, but this gives us beautiful localization. Um, the corneal reflex, underdone. And um, one nuance I'd say with the corneal reflex, it is the corneal re reflex, not the sclera reflex, the corneal reflex. So you need to go for the clear bit of the eye, not the white bit of the eye. Um, usually I get a bit of, uh, of um, gauze and gently touch it. Um, I think it's underdone on the IT unit. It tells you a hell of a lot. Um, I know in this diagram is a bit complicated because they're showing uh, the, the superior task, the, the, yeah, the, the levator palpebrae muscle input from the ocular motor, but that's fairly minor. But the, the important thing is, is the afferent via the trigeminal nerve, which gives us an indication as to what the trigeminal nucleus is doing. Um, and then the efferent uh, via the facial nerve and it can tell us a hell of a lot about the level of of any problems that we have. Um, 
requires presence or absence. Um, the calorific test, personally, is not something I do very often, um, if ever, because it's a bit of a faff. Um, I'm sure that the consultants do brain stem testing. You'll do it a lot more than I ever would. Um, I do use doll's eyes and the oculocephalic reflex. Um, really get in the head. It's, it's a bit of a pain with the ET tube in, but it, it tells us about the about the functioning of the vestibular nuclei um, as well as the abducens, the uh, the longitudinal fasciculi, and it, it can answer a heck of a lot. Particularly when you then combine it with some of the other tests, it does help you localize the level of dysfunction. This is an awful picture that um, always remember you always look to the eye that should be cold. That's how I remember it. You look towards the cold and uh, away from warm. Um, I don't really want to go into too much into the science behind that because it's a bit of a minefield. And finally, something that, that I'm sure the nurses will comment to you quite frequently um, on the critical care unit is loss of cough or gag reflex. Um, with the afferent, of course, being the um, glossopharyngeal and the efferent being the vagus. And that's really important. The gag reflex is a very primitive reflex. You can see the, this is the location the, of the, the structures controlling this, the vagal nuclei right next to the solitary tract and nucleus, which controls your breathing. Um, glossopharyngeal nucleus likewise is fairly nearby. And the nucleus, and there's a few other very critical brainstem nuclei. But once again, you can see if they haven't got a gag reflex, now we're thinking you know, this is a brain stem issue. So very, very important. And you can also look at respiratory patterns. Um, the typical chain stoke breathing pattern, which I think I'm pretty sure every F1 writes that the patient has got chain stoke breathing, um, ataxic, ataxic breathing, the apneic or apneurosis uh, breathing pattern and of course respiratory arrest can tell us a little bit it can be quite difficult I'm sure you with the ventilators on will probably see on the on uh, see on from the ventilator readings so um, quite a lot more than those of us who just sit, sit there watching them breathe um, but it can also be very very useful and really putting this all together is you know in conclusion with this whole talk is that when you see a patient who's unresponsive, um, the question is why they're unresponsive. Do you need to go back through the history? And then when you do see them looking for these subtleties that can tell you the level of the problem, um, where it is. And often, yes, of course, they're going to be on lots and lots of medication. But once you've withdrawn the medication and you're left with an unresponsive patient, where the problem is and which structures are involved, because this, this can completely change uh, the prognosis um, for your patient. All right, questions? It's a pretty short talk. <laughs> I will. Anybody questions? I mean, I'm more than happy to dig into things. There's a lot of uh, holes to go down within this um, uh, sort of particular prognosis and things. Um, I'm mean, more than happy to answer any questions on any of the above, but yeah. Stun silence. I, mean, I think if the, the take home message, though, um, I'm sure your daily reviews when you do just do the D section on your performers about the disability is not just write the GCS and walk away. Um, I think it's very, very important to look at look for some of these signs, the brainstem signs. I find that GCS is particularly unhelpful on it's useful in A&E, but it's not particularly yep. helpful on ITU because there's too much else, as you say, there's too much else going on. There's many drugs. So actually, yeah, the um, using things like the the CAM ICU and yeah, and full more school useful. And all these sort of things, yeah, are a bit more useful. Um, the trouble with all of these things is 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 I find with all of these scoring systems that. It, they're, they're fine if you've got the same person doing them and everyone's doing it, but otherwise it's a bit naff and they tend to miss a lot of the subtleties out. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, they are quite subjective. Very, very yeah. subjective. When a GCS, the second somebody's got unresponsive wakefulness and they open their eyes and everyone goes, oh, they go E4. No, no, well, 
a bit useless. <laughs> I don't know what the guys at the the trainees at the rural thing, but I um when I'm doing GCS in A and E, um you're talking about different ways of finding pain responses. I find that um the fingernail is actually quite useful. And if you do it on both sides, then you can check whether there's any if they're That's not true. particularly conscious whether there's any Low, uh, lateralizing yeah. signs. Yeah, well, it's very helpful. useful, and that's why I tend to. If you're asked to do prognostication, I certainly do. I do all four limbs. Um, yeah. Go for all four. Um, it, typically, the drugged up patient, though, the peripherally, they're a bit shut down anyway, so they can't really feel anything. And supraorbital is a lot more useful. I've just seen my own personal experiences. Sometimes a trapezius squeeze, it can cause bruising. I have seen that happen. Yeah. Uh, then the relatives have a bit of a go at you. Sternal rub can be useful, but then I find I, I know one of my concerns Thanks, loves the sternal rub. Broken ribs and the you know, nightmare, and oh, just I just go for the super orbital. You find the, the super orbital notch and really go for it. Um, I know the, the, if you see the neurosurgeons doing it, they're all trying to outdo each other. And it's a very good way to do it because you want to see the best. You don't want to oh, I just push them in the head and help. You know, you've got to go. It's got to be. It's got to be a painful. Um, not it's not just a, a gentle, soft touch. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be quite brutal. Yeah. The only time I ever do super orbital is doing um brainstem death testing actually. Fair enough. I mean I always do it. I just say used to my non-epileptic patients who are lying there very <laughs> responsive and I go for them quite hard. <laughs> See if I can get anything. Um because at the same time I can check whether they uh this forced eye closure and actually that's a point eye closure uh i mean it's quite a soft sign but you need some cool if, if if there's some resistance to eye opening there's some cortical function going on um it, it's a very useful sign and it's particularly if you if you're worried about your dissociative patient that that forced eye closure is quite useful There's a hand up to the other one. Um, I just want to ask, a lot of the times when we're called to see these patients, they're low GCS and they're worried about the airway. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've used jaw thrust a couple of times. Yeah. Um, not really just as a pain response, but, you know, it sort of seems to do both things at once. Is that sort of acceptable? So jaw thrust is quite useful. I mean, I think I don't know what the literature is on it, um, but I, I, we've used it a few times. I've done exactly the same thing. Yes, I had an epileptic chap who fell and I was like, well, check your GCS whilst I'm holding your airway open. Um, and yeah, it, as long as you're causing it, but it has to be quite pain. You need to really go under the jaw quite hard. And yeah, absolutely, that's fine. You're still going to get that localization, the arm coming up if they're going to open their eyes, yeah, or localize to it. It's quite good at finding people that are actually having pseudo shoes, pseudo shoes as well. Yeah, it makes them stop. I, I mean, the dissociative patient that is a whole nother kettle of fish. There's lots of subtleties with them that, I mean, the whole, you know, I'm doing it. I've got to do a talk anyway on seizures anyway coming up. But it, the, the pattern of movement and it, it, you cannot imitate myoclonus you know it's not something you can try good luck all of us in the department have tried and you can't so actually the the, the, the you know the, the, the non-epileptic you it is a different semiology and if you see it you, you sh it's difficult but you can tell the difference um right. and the other things you know the, the, the cognitive things you look at the eyes the eyes the saccadic eye movements i mean you know you'll see it they look out as i said with the you get these, they'll follow your, make your figure, your outline with the eyes. There's small movements of the, of the eyes, but they're there. Um, a patient who's, who's unresponsive will not make a saccadic eye movement. Um, so it's lots of little things with them. And yeah, the eye closure is very useful. Um, yeah, but, but they're very, very common. Has Ricky persuaded you to do a um, prognostication talk as well then, Peter? Uh, we can do. <laughs> we can do. I'm. Uh, yes, as if you guys like EEGs and MRIs, and I'm more than happy to do that. Um, we do uh, ask them relatively. Well, not re on a. Re it's a relatively regular thing that none of. I would say none of us really understand that well. That it, it always becomes more difficult, isn't it? The take a message with prognostication is it's time, and the biggest problem is people not okay. giving enough time. 
Um, I, the states uh, are well, actually a lot quicker than we are um, at podcast engagement. Talking about persistent and then permanent vegetative state, they only wait three months, whereas in the UK, so we're waiting six to a year, depending on the etiology. So, you know, we're yeah, it's time. Often you just got to wait, 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 wait. Um, uh, I mean, certainly I would say any for prognostication, if any of the trainees are going to Nottingham, the Nottingham City Hospital, one of the very good consultants goes around on a Wednesday and he examines the patients on IT and he's absolutely superb. Um, it's Dr. Donahue there. Um, there's a lot you can see from him and yeah, glean. But yeah, I'm more than happy to. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you very much. All right. Right then, I'm going to go to clinic. So thank you all. Enjoy. <laughs> I will do. <laughs> uh, I'm Alex. I'm one of the CT3s at the Lester Royal ITU, and I'm presenting in Journal Club today uh, a paper called Feasibility of Conservative Fluid Administration and De Resuscitation Compared with Usual Care and Critical Illness, the Role of Active De Resuscitation After Resuscitation to a Radar 2 Randomized Clinical Trial by Silverside et al. It was published in Intensive Care Medicine. This year, 348. I thought I'd start a little bit of background um, for the paper. So, intravenous fluids are often given in large volumes of critically ill patients for acute resuscitation and in attempts to improve cardiac output and ameliorate shock. Uh, findings are that there's accumulation of fluids is typical, especially when we're trying to correct electrolyte imbalances even after this initial phase. And because of the amount of medications many patients are, and critically ill patients are on, there's a lot of solvents volume. So this uh, paper, sorry, this clinical trial was an open label peril group allocation concealed randomized pilot trial, which ran from April 2018 to January 2020. 1,068 patients were screened in eight participating centers. Obviously, because of the nature of the treatment group, while they were um, it was a blind randomization. Once they were put into one of the treatment, either the treatment or the control arm, patients were not randomized at that point. They, for their treatment arm, they identified two main strategies to address the likelihood of positive balance, which was a restrictive approach to fluid resuscitation after admission of 24 to 48 hours, and de resuscitation, which was the active removal of fluid through both diuretics or filtering of the patient. Um, this was this was an objective to investigate the feasibility, safety, and clinical outcomes of a strategy of conservative fluid administration and targeted de resuscitation compared to the usual care of critically ill adult patients. So, um, patients who are allocated to intervention groups, so the non uh, standard critical care treatment, receive a two stage fluid strategy. So from randomization, which was normally the second day or third, the third day of I2 admission, to so study day five, maintenance and treatment fluids were discontinued, and clinical teams were requested not to administrate, administer intravenous fluids unless required to suspect of blood or other overt fluid loss. Intravenous fluids for cardiovascular instability were all sort of the therapies that failed or were contraindicated, or for electrolyte abnormalities were permitted. Medications were reviewed and administered the minimum volume per minute according to local guidelines, and nutrition was administered according to clinical direction and meeting guidelines. The second stage of the intervention consisted of a daily review of eligibility for de resuscitation between study days two and five. And they were deemed appropriate, patients were deemed appropriate or eligible for de resuscitation if they had acquired accumulated fluid balance greater than two liters from. Admission to ITU not uh, entered into the clinical trial, or clinical evidence of edema in at least two areas, which include the lungs. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed the L, so it's flanks, uh, thanks, upper and lower limbs, and there was no contraindication to de resuscitation. The contraindications for most de resuscitations were norepinephrine or epinephrine at dose greater than 0.2 micrograms per kilogram per minute, more than one vasopressor agent. A serum lactate greater than 3.5, uncorrected serum potassium less than 3, or a serum so either hypo or hypernutrinium. On each study data, patients met eligibility criteria for de resuscitation 
combination direct therapy was prescribed. And this consisted of intravenous astrozomide with adjunctive indapamide and spironolactone. The spruzomide was administered at 0.5 mg per kilogram bolus dose with a maximum of 40 mg BD, followed by infusion of 2.5 to 20 mg per hour in tetrabidine, achieving a negative fluid balance. And the aim was to get them minus 3 liters to 1 liter per day. And if this fluid balance target was not achieved despite the maximum protocol of specified dose diuretics, advice was given to commence renal replacement therapy. But this decision was left at the discretion of the treating clinicians across the eight sites. The clinical outcomes they were looking at was the primary outcome was the feasibility of achieving a separation between groups in fluid balance for the 24 hour period from the beginning of study day two to the beginning of study day three. A secondary process outcome included separation of cumulative fluid balance from ICU admission to the beginning of study day three and day five, improvement rate and incidence of protocol deviations. Also, mortality was looked at 28 and 180 days, the duration of mechanical ventilation during their ICU stay, and the length of their stay. They also looked at the incidence of new acute kidney injury. So, patients who were discharged from ICU were contacted by telephone at or as close as possible to 180 days and asked to complete a series of questionnaires regarding cognitive function, symptoms of anxiety and depression, and post traumatic stress disorder. The inclusion criteria was quite broad, so it's patients who were eligible if they were receiving mechanical ventilation. They were between the 24 and 48 hours from ICU admission, but not below 24 hours, and deemed likely to be receiving ICU treatment beyond the next calendar day. This is um, one of the lists for exclusion criteria. There were further ones in one of the subsections, and they'll come up in one of the flowcharts later. Um, so patients were Ineligible, I'm so sorry, not eligible, if they were having active treatment for diabetic ketoacidosis, they were in a hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, they had a non traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, they were in acute cardiac failure, they were in cardiogenic shock, and end stage renal failure, or diabetes insipidus. This was the design of the trial. So there was 1,068 patients that met inclusion criteria, and 888 of them were excluded. Um, 204 were excluded because they were not expected to survive for 72 hours, 126 for cardiac failure, 90 they were unable to get consent, and later one will withdraw consent as well through a lawyer. 76 were missed. Um, the 74 were not eligible because of lack of clinical equipoios, which is a lot of favorable. Um, Subarachnoid hemorrhage for 47, DK or HHS for 24, and safe renal disease for 16. And they weighed less than 40, and there was an other 219. Of this, 180 patients were randomized in a one to one allocation, 90 going to the usual care, and 90 going to the intervention. And one patient, through a lawyer, consent was withdrawn after being randomized. Um, and then two patients were lost to follow up in the usual care arm. So, looking at the fluid balance of patients, we have the control group within the red. And the intervention group is in green. We can see at study day one, there's an overlap between the two numbers of fluid balance where the, there's no difference. And then by day three, there's a significant difference, which uh, is still significant in day five, but it, it's quite close. And the cumulative fluid balance, sorry, that was the daily fluid balance of those days. And the cumulative fluid balance, and by day four, there is a significant difference between the control and intervention group. Uh, fluid intake, we have usual care in red and an intervention group in green. So the fluid intake, um, which they broke it down into bolus, blood, maintenance, nutrition, medication. Um, I think the major differences you can see are in the bolus and maintenance groups where usual care is higher. Oddly enough, the intervention group the nutrition is mildly higher but not significant and the medication is higher but not significant. And you can see the actual fluid output of patients. You can see an extension of fluid output in the intervention group here. And then, that once again, in renal replacement therapy, they were aiming to be a negative balance. Um, this, is, this is quite a busy thing in the group. Um, so what I just wanted to do is focus in on the only significant results they found, which were basically in the changes in fluid balance. Uh, none of the other outcomes were considered significant, significant because of the power of the study, um, but the actual uh, 
the mean fluid balance, the cumulative fluid balance were different between the two arms of the study. But all other um, factors, there wasn't enough power to do check. Um, except for one group I want to discuss, which is the sepsis results. It, it's not on um, the outcomes uh, table in the paper, but they do mention it in the result. There was a subgroup of patients with sepsis, which was 72 patients uh, between the two arms. And they found that the severity of illness and use of beta pressors and RRT, sorry, renal replacement therapy, were greater at baseline patients in the intervention arm than the usual care arm. And mortality in 28 days was higher in the intervention group, which was 35% in usual care. And this was a significant difference. There was no other significant difference in kind of outcomes between the two treatment arms. And statistical interaction between sepsis subgroup and treatment arm was not present. Um, the authors do talk about this um, increased mortality in sepsis, which they feel was attributed to the small sample size of patients. So they're uncertain about what is the other. There's a number of limitations. Um, the first couple I'm going to talk about was brought up by the paper itself. So they said they admitted it was underpowered to determine feasibility. Um, there was an imbalance of randomization arms for the intervention arm having a greater requirement for supportive measures. There was unmeasured baseline characteristics of sedation, imprecise measures for initiation of de-resuscitation. It was often left up to the clinical team, which differed between sites. Failure to comply with protocolized intervention due to clinical foes. A small portion of the patient meeting, including criteria, were randomized. So we talked earlier about how there was 1,068 patients who could have been randomized and 888 were lost. And one thing they don't mention is limitation, but I think it is a limitation of study, is that there was increased mortality in the treatment arm of patients with sepsis. And because many of our patients in intensive care end up being treated for sepsis, and I think it's quite important some group. Um, and the application is the possible and non septic patients for at least no extra harm in conservative fluid therapy or fluid management and de resuscitation of critically ill patients. Limiting cause of fluid balance outside the hemodynamic the instability phase is feasible. And the possible possibility of use of de resuscitation in patients at risk of renal cardiovascular compromise. So they found no increased incidence of de resuscitation, de -resuscitation causing further renal or cardiovascular compromise in either uh, in the treatment arm. And that's pretty much all I, I had for the radar two group. Um, I didn't read the radar one paper. But that's about it. Is there any questions? Thanks, Alex. How do you think will it affect what you're going to do next time you have a set or a patient who's got a bit got a positive fluid balance on the unit? Um, I don't know. I, I had a I had to think about that. I I find it hard to believe that I would want to give someone renal replacement therapy to just drive down their fluid balance based on this study. Um, I think we have a tendency to overfill patients because it's it's sort of an easier easier choice. And I, I've never really thought about how much fluid, well never really thought, I, I don't always think about how much fluid I'm giving with the medications the patients are receiving. And I think that was quite an interesting point by it that, uh, you know, some of these medications have a huge solvent volume that we don't really think of. Yeah, they do. Maybe, maybe I'll be less aggressive next time, but I don't know, I always feel like it's better to give them a fluid bolus and try and get them off NORAD than it is. Depends how much NORAD they're on, I think. If you're on bucket loads of it, then yes, definitely. If they're only on a little bit, then it's not too much of a stress, I think. But yeah, it is good to, obviously, it's good to avoid drugs with side effects. The thing to remember, I think, is that fluids have side effects too, don't they? So. But I, I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like if I did a patient, I did a tilt table test, and I got a response to blood pressure, I would still give them a bolus of fluid. Maybe, maybe moving away from pure maintenance and more bolus driven, be better yeah. yeah, I think so. I I don't really like just running fluids for the sake of it. 
and just give them give them nutrition mentally or parentally whatever's doing and then give them like you say give them flow as and when they need it rather than just running 100 mils of normal saline that's very upsetting when that happens we had we had quite an interesting patient um a couple of weeks ago and you know we were handed over that they had nine and a half liters of crystalloid during the operation and i think there was a real push not to give them more fluids but every time you tilted them their systolic improved by more than 10 and if you gave like two to more bowls their systolic came up yeah I think as clinicians, we have this real problem where once we've heard something, we sort of, it sort of anchors in and affects our further treatment rather than treating the person in front of you, like the, the moment in front of you. Yeah. It's called confirmation bias, and it's a significant problem. You you see or you you see what you expect to see. It's the same with them um, uh, interpreting X, chest X-rays for NG tubes. You see, you see the NG tube where you think it's going to be, right? even when it's not it's a lot, a significant portion of the never events that happen with feeding are related to that a confirmation bias. Um, better get back to go back to work, I think. Thanks, guys. Thank you.